Assalamu alaikum dear students. So today Medikuma presents to you endometrial hyperplasia. So what basically endometrial hyperplasia means? This means that there is enlargement, there is hyperplasia of the endometrium, which is defined as disturbed gland to stroma ratio. By this I mean that the endometrial hyperplasia basically is the excessive proliferation of endometrium relative to stroma of the glands relative to stroma to stroma. This means that what this endometrial hyperplasia means that we have large amount of glands related to stroma. Let's demonstrate this concept. So I take a patch of endometrium here. This is our endometrium and I take a patch of endometrium. By this definition, I mean that if this is a patch of endometrium and normally there are four glands present. And the rest of it is stroma. So what basically happens in endometrial hyperplasia is that the number of glands increase relative to stroma. Got this point? Yes. That the number of glands are now more in number related to stroma and this condition is known as endometrial hyperplasia. So to understand this condition, first of all, let's uh, just uh, rewind our knowledge of physiology. So, in the menstrual cycle, the first 14 days comprises of the proliferative phase. And the next 14 days are comprised of the secretory phase. Now the first, this proliferative phase is guided by estrogen axis, whereas the secretory phase is guided by progesterone axis. How? So normally, when this follicle is developing, and this follicle, uh, I have this enlarged follicle, and this follicle is composed of three layers. The outer layer is, any idea? This outer layer, what is this called? This is known as theta cell layer. And this black shell is known as granulosa cell layer. And whereas, ohm is residing inside so what happens normally the theta cell normally produces androgens theta cell produces androgens and these androgens then go toward the granulosa cell layer where these androgens are converted into estrogen yes. these estrogen then are responsible for the proliferative phase of the endometrium and they increases the size of endometrium then what happens at the 14 day there is LX surge there is LX surge means that and after which what happens ovulation. ovulation happens and when the ovulation happens what is left inside the what is left inside this follicle converts into when ovulation happens, this follicle converts into corpus luteum. This follicle converts into corpus luteum. And what will and what will this corpus luteum secrete? Corpus luteum will secrete progesterone. Let's replay it. What happened? We are having uh, uh, theta cell layer. Theta cell layer was producing androgens. These androgens were moving toward the granulosa cell layer, where these androgens were converted into the estrogen. This estrogen was responsible for the proliferative phase and for the proliferation of the endometrium. Now, what happens at the 14 day of cycle when there is an surge, there is ovulation, and what is left inside? Corpus luteum is left inside, and this corpus luteum is responsible for the production of progesterone. Now, this is the concept. Progesterone is responsible for two functions. Progesterone will make this endometrium more secretory. More secretory and more juicy. This progesterone will make this endometrium more secretory and more juicy. And second function of this progesterone is to this progesterone will inhibit 
the proliferative effect of estrogen. This progesterone will inhibit the proliferative effect of estrogen. So basically there is a balance. And this balance is between estrogen and progesterone. progesterone. So in the first 14 day of the cycle, the balance is more toward the estrogen. Whereas in the second 14 day of the cycle, the balance is more toward the progesterone. In the first 14 day of the cycle, the balance is toward the estrogen. And the next 14 day of the cycle, the balance is toward the progesterone. So the proliferative effect of uh, estrogen is cancelled by the progesterone. Means that till the 14 days, whatsoever proliferation happened, it will be counter-regulated in the next 14 days. So where this is the point when pathology starts. And how is this pathology start? If we are having excess of estrogen, if we are having excess of estrogen, by this I mean that there is estrogen excess, and this excess is not counter-regulated by progesterone. So there will be the start of pathology, and this will lead to the condition known as endometrial hyperplasia. So whatever thing that it, that it causes estrogen excess will be a risk factor of. Endometrial hyperplasia. Anything that causes estrogen excess will be a risk factor of endometrial hyperplasia. So now we are going to discuss the causes of estrogen excess. Any idea? Term number first is obesity. And this is very common cause. And hence it's a risk factor of endometrial hyperplasia. What happens basically in obesity? We are having a lot of fats. In obesity, we are having a lot of fats, and these fats androgens are converted into Pretty estrogens. In the fat tissue, the in the adipose tissue, the androgens are converted into estrogens. So we are having estrogen excess, and this estrogen will lead to endometrial hyperplasia. The second thing is the end of ovulatory cycle. Can you explain how will an ovulatory cycle leads to endometrial hyperplasia? Okay, and now uh, just concentrate over here that if this is a follicle and it does not ovulate, means that this follicle remains inside the ovary. So there will be no formation of what? Corpus luteum. So there will be no corpus luteum, as there will be no progesterone, and which will result in a endometrium that will be guided only by the estrogenic phase but no progesterone phase means that there will be first 14 days of cycle the estrogen will lead to the proliferation of the endometrium and then after that proliferation there should be ovulation but this person is going through an ovulatory cycle so there will be no ovulation and there will be no progesterone phase there will be no progesterone phase and hence the, there will be first estrogenic cycle then after 14 days another estrogenic cycle after 14 days another estrogenic cycle means that this person will chronically goes through estrogen driven uh, endometrial proliferation and this condition will lead to endometrial hyperplasia okay the third thing is that is also very common risk factor is polycystic ovarian syndrome so what happens basically in polycystic ovarian sy syndrome? In polycystic ovarian syndrome, let's say if this is the ovary, there are a lot of cysts. In polycystic ovarian syndrome, there are a lot of cysts. And these cysts which are present, they do not ovulate. These cysts do not ovulate. So there will be chronic anovulation. Secondly, if these cysts are not ovulating, there will be no progesterone. But these cysts will produce estrogen. estrogen. And then again, this estrogen will cause our endometrium to proliferate, and which is a predisposing factor for endometrial hyperplasia. Another very important factor is number four is granulosa cell. Tumor. Now, I told you earlier that theca cell will secrete androgens and these androgens will go toward the granulosa cell where these androgens are converted into the estrogen. estrogen. So, if there is a tumor of granulosa cell, there will be excess of estrogen production and hence there will be endometrial hyperplasia. So, these were some of the risk factors of 
Endometrial hyperplasia. What were these factors? Number one, obesity. Second one was anovulatory cycle. Third one was polycystic ovarian syndrome. And the fourth one was granulosa cell tumor. Any confusion? Any confusion? Clear. Okay. So now we we'll go toward the uh, pathogenesis. That how it happens. And there will be some genetic correlation. Okay, so if I am taking a single cell from our endometrium and this single cell is having its genetic material here. And let's say these are estrogen receptors. This is your estrogen. Got this idea? There's estrogen and this estrogen will bind to estrogen receptor. Then what will this estrogen receptor do? This estrogen receptor will go towards the some some new these some genetic material, some genes. And this estrogen, when they combine with some genes, they will upregulate their function. They will upregulate the function of certain genes this is the normal physiology that when estrogen comes it binds to certain receptor and this receptor then moves towards certain genes and this the function of these genes will be upregulated now what happens there is a pathway that is normally present that is p 13 k akt pathway this pathway can overstimulate. This pathway can overstimulate the the function of the estrogen receptors. What is the function of estrogen receptors? The function of estrogen receptor is to upregulate certain genes. And the and, and when these genes upregulate, what will be the effect? What will be the effect? There will be proliferation. There will be over proliferation. What is the effect of estrogen on the endometrium? Over proliferation. Over proliferation. Over proliferation. So the effect of the estrogen uh, receptors on the gene is to up uh, is, is to upregulate certain genes, and when these genes are upregulated, there will be over proliferation of endometrium. So if uh, and this pathway p 13 k a pathway is normally responsible for the overstimulation of this. Uh, of the function of these estrogenic genes and here is a gene known as there is a very important gene known as P10 not like this this gene is known as P10 if you don't remember anything just remember the name of this gene P10 this P10 is a tumor suppressor gene this P10 is a Tumor suppressor gene. Now we have found that in the most of the cases of endometrial hyperplasia and also endomet endometrial carcinoma, endometrial carcinoma, this P10 gene is mutant. And what is the function? And it is a tumor suppressor gene, means that it, it acts as molecular break. This tumor and what is the function of this P10? P10 normally inhibits P13K AKT pathway. P10 normally inhibits P13K AKT pathway. So if there is mutation in the P10, and which kind of mutation will be it? This mutation will be loss of function or gain of function? Any idea? Gain of function. Loss of function. If this mutation is loss of function, means that normally as breaks. So if there is loss of function mutation in P10, then it's, uh, that it is no longer uh, able to do its normal function. And what is its normal function? Inhibition, inhibition of p 13 ATT pathway. So if this P10 is lost, this inhibition effect will be lost. And the function of the estrogen on the receptor will be uh, upregulated. It will be stimulated, overstimulated, and there will be over proliferation of endometrium, which will lead to endometrial hyperplasia and then into endometrial carcinoma. So this was about the pathogenesis of endometrial hyperplasia. Now we will just 
do a little bit of classification of endometrial hyperplasia. So there is an old classification and there is a new classification. So old classification divides endometrial hyperplasia into the four categories. Simple hyperplasia, simple hyperplasia without atypia. Complex hyperplasia without, without atypia. Simple. Simple hyperplasia with atypia, with atypia. Complex and complex hyperplasia with atypia. with atypia. So this is an old classification which divides our endometrial hyperplasia into four categories. There is simple hyperplasia without atypia, there is complex hyperplasia without atypia, there is simple hyperplasia with atypia and there is complex hyperplasia with atypia. So now there is a new classification and it is a much easier classification. This classification divides endometrial hyperplasia into two categories. And these two categories are hyperplasia without atypia and hyperplasia with atypia. This classification divides the uh, endometrial hyperplasia into two categories that whether there will be atypia with this hyperplasia or there will be no atypia. And this atypia, do you know what is atypia? Atypia is basically the polymorphism and the change in there is cyto cytoplasmic atypia or nuclear atypia. That is, there will be a change in nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio will be increased. So if this atypia is present, uh, hyperplasia. without atypia and hyperplasia with atypia so when there is this atypia is very important why is this important because if there is no atypia there are about three percent chances that this pro this cancer will progress to Carcinoma. If there is no atypia, there are about 3% chances that this, cancer, this hyperplasia will move towards the carcinoma. But if there is atypia present, there are about more than 50% chances that this cancer, this hyperplasia will progress towards atypia. So the risk of cancer with the atypia is very much. So, the, so this is a very important point to know that atypia, if there is atypia present, endometrial hyperplasia will progress to endometrial carcinoma and how will this atypia look like in this endometrial in this hyperplasia without atypia there will be there will be only enlargement of only increase in the number of glands back to back glands present you will find the word in, in your book back to back glands present that a lot of glands are present but there is no atypia. In this hyperplasia with atypia, what is the case? In the hyperplasia with atypia, there are a lot of glands, but there are some other things also present. These glands will be irregular, and these glands will have a lot of branches. And another thing which will be present that these glands will have an increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. And this is known as hyperplasia with atypia. So I will show you a diagram. So in this diagram, in this diagram, you can see that there is only in this diagram there is only hyperplasia, and this hyperplasia is not associated with atypia. But here, here you can see that there is a hyperplasia, but there is also atypia. These glands are somewhat irregular, and these glands are regular. And secondly, these glands are having increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Now let's come towards the treatment of endometrial hyperplasia. So any management in your mind, dear students, any management? Hysterectomy, hysterectomy is indicated in much of in many cases of endometrial hyperplasia with atypia. Hysterectomy, if and if the female does not want to conceive, hyperplasia 
with a tipia. If there is hyperplasia with the tipia and female uh, uh, doesn't want any pregnancy, so we can do hysterectomy, removal of the uterus. We can also uh, do a therapy known as progesterone therapy. What was the function of progesterone? The function of progesterone was to oppose the proliferative effect of estrogen. So if we do progestin only therapy, this can also be a treatment of endometrial hyperplasia. So uh, thank you. We have our regular lecture.